this thing called recovery is never going to be something anyone sticks with unless it's fun. I'm a firm believer in that, especially kids. Kids have got to know that it's fun. Kids have got to know that it's cool to be sober. Um, but that's only going to start if adults find recovery a privilege rather than that sense of duty and work or punishment for behavior. So long as we believe that this is a, a behavioral abnormality by people who misjudge and make mistakes and are being self-willed, we will always have a shame base for it. It's the one thing that hasn't morphed into something else. Betty Ford used to say that the only reason I didn't come into treatment sooner was there was nothing wrong with me. They all thought there was something wrong with me. So, you know, we can only go into the darkness and use in the quiet, dark corners and go into denial if shame is the basis. But if we simply have a disease that needs to be treated, we follow the instructions and treat it, then recovery becomes a healing gift and everybody benefits for it. So there are some things that we have to uh, agree upon, and that is we just talked a little bit in another meeting about how some physicians will argue this point, but that's because they're dumb. I'm, <laughs> I mean, you know, medical schools are not noted for their um, uh, paying attention to one of the most incredible public health um, issues of our time. So time and time again, even to this day, you'll find young physicians telling me that they've trained for, you know, one or two lectures or maybe a week on addiction, but they trained for three weeks on tropical diseases and they live in Detroit. <laughs> So something doesn't make sense there. And it's our responsibility to change that, and we, we, we do educate them vigorously now, but that's been left over for a while. And the reason for that is I think most of the people that don't understand this as a disease have to draw upon their experience of loved ones or not so loved ones in their past. There was always an Uncle Louie for Dr. Joe, or there was an Aunt Mary for Dr. Sarah, you know? that was a drunk or a, an addict or abused the family system and they have horrible memories of that and, and... So how can we tell what looks like on the surface to be intentional behavior, drinking in excess, popping pills and so forth is really a disease? With a target organ, that's the brain. Well, first of all, when you target the brain in a disease that's a chronic organic disease of the brain, chronic means it's not going to go away rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, chronic, you're going to treat it for life, live with it. There's other things you can get. And with this disease, the treatment makes you a better person. Doesn't make you sick like chemotherapy. Makes people love you more. Doesn't cost a lot, like a buck a week. I mean, a buck a meeting or something. Two bucks a meeting, actually. Um, like other diseases, addiction has a set of symptoms. So I go to a diabetes clinic and I know that people whose blood sugar elevates, you're all going to have the same symptoms in the diabetes clinic. You're going to pee a lot and eat a lot, right? You're going to get very thirsty and want to drink a lot. Um, you may get other consequences from elevated blood sugar like visual changes or kidney problems or neuropathy. Well, people with this disease have lack of control craving for the drug of choice and persistent use despite adverse consequences. Duh. I mean, no one would get in trouble if they didn't have persistent use despite adverse consequences. Okay. So, um, and I think that speaks to the title of my first book, Hijacking the Brain. The brain's going to get hijacked. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But if this disease takes control of the brain, and here's some data for those of you that may not believe me that you can look at that goes around to some of the better early studies of this. Um, uh, and like many diseases, it has a genetic and an environmental influence. Um, addiction uh, has been shown to be uh, four times more likely to occur in a child who is the offspring of one 
alcoholic or addicted parent, okay? For example, Mark Shuckett has done those studies. Studies have been done on twins, and so identical twins, more than fraternal twins, have a greater likelihood. Um, but if you don't have any genes at all for the addiction, you know, go back five generations and everybody was a nun or, you know, a teetotaler, or, um, um, you can still have an environmental factor kick up. So if you are growing up over a bar room next to a crack house in downtown Philadelphia and all your friends and homeboys are running methamphetamine out of the bridge, chances are that system is one that can pull even a person with no genetics into the mix. Agreed? Okay. Um, which may not be all that different from a kid from a non-drinking background going into the right college dormitory. Doesn't have to be under a bridge. Addiction is an equal opportunity destroyer. Okay, so this socioeconomic class is going to get it the same as this socioeconomic group. Just the same, you know, this demographic, this demographic, this cultural background, this cultural background. Um, um, and, and, and addiction genes don't have an expiration date, so they can be activated for a lifetime. And the symptoms are biological, emotional, or psychological, social, and spiritual. Now, I pay attention to the last one because if that key element is not got, we're going to have a little problem. By the way, who has the Cadillac with the Colts plate? Ah. Uh. <laughs> you bought a blue car and you got blue on your coat. All right, we'll talk. I'm going to the game later. <laughs> With Ursa. Um, that's a, another story. Anyway, um, the spiritual part is so important. There's a reason why we call this <gasps> respiration. Okay? In the moment of my breath, why don't you all take one? You have absolute and total control. It is the only time that we have it. It's the only time that your ass is sitting in the place where you have control, when you stop and breathe. Now that's no news, you know. Buddhists and Hindus have been telling us that for eons that we have control in that moment. The other thing to know is that we all most likely will all do the same last thing, which is <sighs> before we go, that's the last thing we do. So we are connected in a spiritual sense, that's what con spirituality means, connection, pardon my back, it, 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 there's nothing here that's a religious connotation. Higher power can be G-O-D or it can be group of drunks, G-O-D, okay? Higher power can be her or him, higher, so long as it's just not you, so long as you're connected to something else, then it seems as though the great Dr. Carl Jung, when he wrote about Roland, who was sent to him because he was the greatest psychiatrist at Bollingen in Switzerland, he said, he wrote a letter back and he says, Dear Roland, I don't think, and Roland had relapsed on alcohol about a hundred times, was from a wealthy U.S. family that sent him there, I don't think there's much that I can do for a patient of your type. It seems that the only thing that's going to change is a spiritual awareness, a spiritual change in you. I've seen this magic before, and the magic all started in a group called Alcoholics Anonymous, really, when one person had a spiritual connection to another person, they shared their story and suddenly they were bonded and they said, well, this is going to work better than just about anything. So that's critical to note. Um, biological consequences are important and we do talk about consequences more than symptoms because they're pretty horrific. You can talk about Heroin, I've seen heroin addicts play jazz. I was uh, on jazz clubs when I was a kid with my family, and I saw some of the greatest musicians of all time live into the 80s with regular daily nice injections 
been using heroin like a lady or a gentleman. You don't see that with alcohol. Alcohol is the bomb, okay? Alcohol is a head-to-toe killer. It will shrink the brain similar to Alzheimer's and cause or lead to Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, a form of psychosis with marked dementia and uh, memory problems. If mixed with alcohol in pill form, it's called benzodiazepines. Dehydrated alcohol is Xanax and Valium. The brain says, wow, two of those and you just gave me a pint of vodka and I'm not throwing up. That's terrific. The brain uses it that way. Um, the digestive system gets direct irritations from this neurotoxin. The liver doesn't like it very much because it gets fatty and then can get fibrotic and move on. There can be bleeding disorders and um, immune system disorders in the spleen and, and our immune cells don't react as well so people with this affliction will be susceptible to outside diseases more than others. Of course, major consequences with um, blood pressure and heart failure, wasting of the muscle system, uh, joint degeneration, hip replacements early, and of course, mental or cognitive dysfunction that's measurable and demonstrative. If you catch it early enough, we can reverse it. A good, uh, a good advertisement for early intervention. It can be reversed and neurocognitive restoration is a whole new field in functional medicine that we had a chance to discuss earlier, but literally the administration of 100 milligrams of thiamine intramuscularly for seven to 30 days in a newly formed detoxifying alcoholic will save their brain and turn that around, okay? Um, the other drugs, there's all kinds of problems. You know what they are, accidental overdoses. Mix a little opiate with a little benzos, add some alcohol to it. That's all you need for a toxic lethal, lethal mix. The emergency rooms have a new name for it, you know, toxic combination. Um, that is your Heath Ledgers, there's your John Belushi's, there's uh, Janice Joplin and um, Jimi Hendrix and a bunch of them. Um, hep C is in epidemic proportions now, which can lead to cirrhosis, kidney diseases, liver diseases, altered brain chemistry, um, cardiovascular and respiratory changes, heart attacks with cocaine and so forth, and direct effect from the vasoconstriction of cocaine on the mucous membranes for people who snort it. So the street drugs have their own set of consequences. Socially, they kind of fall back into one group, both alcohol and street drugs and, and other prescription medications with depression, anxiety, poor performance in the job, divorce, relationship issues, all the things you already know about, and of course, legal issues. Um, so there's um, social consequences, relationship I can't say enough about, those of you who suffer from the other killer disease, codependence, um, know what I'm talking about. We'll have an Al-Anon meeting later, if you like. Um, um, you see all the alcoholics just ran out of the room. Just, you know, <laughs> oh my God, he said the A word. Uh, um, spiritual consequences, we just don't grow. In isolation and without stimulation spiritually, you stop growing. The, there's a disconnection. Addiction drives a, a, a wedge between my, my heart and my soul and my brain. It just drives a wedge through there. There's no connection. I can come a million times and sit and, oh my God, why is Jerry you know, in treatment for the 10th time? He just sits there and all this stuff goes into the head but it's gotta be connected to the heart and to the soul. I'm recovering from a big brain tumor I had a couple of years ago and I died in aftercare and my family came to me. My family's all dead. And I said to the nurse, what are you giving me that would make me hallucinate? And she said, you're not on anything that would make you hallucinate. Why do you ask? It's because my mother's sitting over there wearing the same outfit that she was buried in. And she was the only one that came in in form, okay? The other angels, my brothers, my father, all came at me looking like lit tapers, like candlelight. And when they came, they would come to me and identify themselves. And I didn't hear words 
They identified themselves, I call it soul talking. They talked to my soul, I just knew. And they all said the same thing. It's not time, go back, go back to work. So if we don't connect with patients, there's nothing really profound about that experience. You know, it's happened to me twice. Um, it's pretty cool. What's cool about it is it takes the fear of death away. You know what I mean? Now that doesn't mean I ride a skateboard. <laughs> That shit. I don't surf. I don't go out with my grandson. I mean, if I got the gift, I'll keep it nice and easy. But um, without that connection, which is the same in recovery, you know, the nice thing about it is, what's the difference? I, I hate the word rehab, and I'll tell you why. Okay, if you're suffering from a broken leg, a cracked femur, and I was in sports medicine for many years, and you send someone out with a cracked femur, let alone a cracked brain and a cracked heart from addiction. Think about the time it's gonna to take to get better, okay? You know that that bone's not gonna to start to heal for six months, whether it has a rod in it or whether in the old ways you're in traction, right? Okay, once the bone heals, you don't jump up and run a marathon. You don't have any balance, you don't have any muscle, you don't have any good neuro sensation, um, 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 and muscle control at all, and certainly you don't have any stamina. You lost that while you were rehealing. So rehabilitation is going to take maybe another 18 months before that person's running baby things and then maybe walking in, in marathons and so forth. So they may hope to get 80, 85, 90% of where they were but they still might walk with a limp or have pain or always be reminded in cold weather that this has happened. In recovery, there's no limit. A person in recovery will go to 200% of what they were before because a disease that takes away your awareness, a disease that keeps you in denial, can progress so profoundly that the amount of recovery that one can perceive is limitless, and families will see this all the time. I never thought you could do this or that. I just never thought you'd finish school. I never thought you'd get married and have a happy life. I never thought. So it's limitless. That's a big difference. Um, here we are detached from the soul, and in that time when you are detached from the soul and consequences, Alcoholics and addicts of my type act without integrity, and that's where people get really pissed off. That's where families get injured, and that is inexcusable. I don't consider anybody responsible for inheriting this disease or growing up in an uncontrollable environment that fosters it. I consider everybody 200% responsible for the proper treatment once they get the diagnosis. And in this day and age, there's enough help for the haves and the have-nots. There are programs everywhere that can get someone on the right track. So once that happens, it's a game changer. It's the responsibility of the loved ones to learn about the disease and let go of the blame. Why is it taking you this long? Oh, yeah, but if only. You know, some people are just not ready to change until they're ready. And that's not their choice always. Sometimes it's a gift from whatever higher power we have, whoever she may be. How'd I do? <laughs> um, so what's the difference between choice and the disease? Well, I'm going to try to talk to you about that. A disease has certain traits, epidemiology, genetics. It has um, um, clinical criteria, neurobiology, and treatment. I'm going to touch on that because I want you educated. And I'm going to go a little faster now, so stick with me. And if I don't say it, it's all in being sober. This is not a plug for the book. I will tell you, and this is only, this is not a bragging point. This is a blessing point, okay? I've never made a penny from the book being sober. Every time someone buys a book, we give two away. So this, it goes to the prisons, it goes to other treatment centers, so that's just my good fortune, and I let you share it, so um, that's where the money goes if, if someone buys that book. Um, 
Epidemiology is interesting. Addiction is everywhere. It's in 35% uh, of the psychiatric admissions, 20% uh, of hospitals. All the trauma, that's a low number on trauma victims. Most uh, JACO approved hospitals, if you have trauma in the emergency room, you're almost required to do an addiction survey on the spot to see if that's a co-occurring problem for a person coming in after an accident and so forth. And 80% of prison, that's also a low number, I think. It's a published number, but I think it's low. Most of the guys that I know tell me they, they can make coffee, you know, alcohol from coffee grinds and, you know, what's it called, Puna? Something like that. If you tell me, I'll know where you've been. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it affects males more than females. And look at the lifetime prevalence. Few diseases can get up to 14%. This is both drugs and alcohol. And if you go for the important co-occurring mental disorder, many of you are disturbed because some of the people that you know and your own experience is that there was a depression or there was anxiety and the substance I used was a, an attempt to self-medicate. It calmed me down or it speeded me up, okay? We have to put someone into detoxification and see what they are 30 days after their last substance to know if that was a substance-related mental illness and it's going to go away, which happens 85% of the time, or an independent disorder that needs to be appropriately treated with non-addictive chemicals that won't cross-react with their drug of choice and reactivate the disease of addiction. Is that clear? Okay. Um, <coughs> Two times the death rate for men, three times for women. This is not fair to uh, women. If you have a lady here and a man here, exactly the same body weight and given the same alcohol load, her blood levels will be higher. Simple. Usually the same is true for drugs. It's about chemistry and fat content and hormones that make it different. I was in Vermont as a country physician for 35 years and I was everything, you know, pediatrician and neurosurgeon. <laughs> epidemiologists, you know, when you're the only guy, you're the only guy, you know, plastics or whatever. But one of my jobs was also medical examiner and coroner. And unfortunately, um, I can remember far too many New Year's Eves, Thanksgivings, and Christmas Eves when I was called out to find that someone had taken their own life. 95% of the time they were drunk or stoned loaded on something. So it has six times the suicide rate. And it, the major factor in the four leading causes for this young, vibrant age group. Now, cirrhosis, uh, uh, accidents, suicide, and homicides that are drug and alcohol related is no surprise to me. But cirrhosis of the liver, 25 to 44, it says. When I trained in medicine, you know, when Henry Ford was alive or something. <laughs> when I trained in medicine, we trained in VA hospitals. And if you know a little bit about alcoholism, when the liver, which needs a constant blood flow, becomes cirrhotic and fibrotic, then the blood backs up. So an alcoholic will get varicose veins in their esophagus with a bleeding disorder because of low platelets, retching or vomiting, which happens to alcoholics frequently, will cause a tear. So a common way for alcoholics or addicts to die in that stage of their life is to bleed to death from the mouth. Okay. Um, when I trained, the only way to treat that in the VA hospitals was they had an alky ward. And there was six beds on one side and six beds on the other side. Now, who's seen the movie Awakenings? You know what I'm talking about with that one, right? Okay, it's kind of a creepy little movie, but people popped up. You walk into, talk about creepy, you walk into a, a, a meeting, uh, or, or rather a room, uh, the Alki Ward, and sitting up in bed, they're all men, were veterans, all from World War II, some Koreans. And they were all 65, 70 plus years of age. They were sitting up in bed wearing football helmets. Okay, none with the Colts. No, no. <laughs> football helmets with a single guard on it like Mike Dicker wore, you know, just a single guard, okay? 
their mouths were open, and coming out of their mouths was the rubber end of a balloon that was inflated in their esophagus to press on those varicose veins. So their existence was to sit up in bed with their mouth open while this thing pulled tension and tied off on the guard. That was their life. A lot of them were still smoking through trach tubes this way. Now, at the Betty Ford Center, when I was there, and certainly in treatment, uh, in my own practice now, I will see young ladies at 26 years of age, yellow with cirrhosis of the liver. So the disease is morphing. It morphs all the time. Addiction used to be just about alcohol. When did it become an opiate dilemma? When, when, okay, there was always a little part. There was always heroin, but it was kind of quiet. And now it's morphed. How is it morphed? Well, good Lord, it's morphed to a digital age. We have video games and telephone addictions now, and we have, you know, sex addictions from an internet and pornography, and I mean, the disease will morph. So some people think it's just the disease of more. I want more of everything, you know? And that's where cross addiction's bad, when someone gives up alcohol and feels like they're being punished because they lost their best friend and figure, well, now I should have three desserts. You know, it's stupid thinking, but <laughs> it's stupid thinking. Okay. Alcohol um, has uh, the opportunity to give you seven times greater chance at another, uh, I'm sorry, seven times greater chance of having a second addiction for any, any person with a single addiction. So there's seven times greater they're gonna have a second addiction. And in the demographic I work with, which is substance abusing high achievers, entertainers and CEOs and you know people with big egos and stupidity beyond stupidity. You know, they measure their IQ by their wallet, that kind of stuff. Um, um, the, the other one is workaholism. That's a big one. Amongst alcoholics, a 37% chance, and amongst um, addicts, drug addicts, a 53% that there's gonna be a secondary mental health disorder. If you don't treat the mental health disorder as a dual diagnosis, you've only treated half of the problem. Okay? So, what does this say? It is a psychiatric classification addiction. It has, it's, it's a chronic organic disease of the brain. That means mood. That means autoregulation. That means cognitive ability. That means decision making. And if anybody hasn't noticed, most alcoholics and addicts really make shit decisions, right? I mean, like, oh my God, like, <laughs> oh, I can drive, give me those keys. Uh, I don't know how me. Oh, she's married, so what? Families um, uh, with genetic studies and adoption studies I've mentioned have these incredible um, increased chances of developing the disease. So the equation looks something like addiction is a combination of genetics and exposure or environment. When I say comorbid disorders in the genetics, well, that may be, um, birth defects, it may be a head injury, it certainly could be a learning disability that will make someone a little bit more susceptible to disease. Um, when I say environment plus stressors, it would be socioeconomic stressors, histories of abuse, histories of neglect. It's, a lot of people think that addiction is a lot of uh, learning disorders, it's a learning uh, behavioral problem, and a lot of people think, and it's, a, it's an attachment problem. So people with very traumatic backgrounds, big attachment issues that were neglected or abandoned or had uncaring parents, um, uh, the child uh, did never felt safe, finds very fertile ground for the disease of addiction, okay? The difference between choice and disease, sounds like I'm still trying to convince you, doesn't it? Okay, uh, choice is in the upper brain, in the prefrontal cortex, and the disease is in the lower brain, so it's in two different areas. So if I went to this nice guy and said, give me the watch, um, 
and you're not going to get it back, and I stole his watch. It's a choice for my upper brain, and I didn't make that choice in a, in a minute. I made that choice thinking, okay, he's a big guy, but maybe I can outrun him. I don't have a watch now. I sold mine for drugs. I don't know what time it is, and I used to get compliments on watches from all the pretty girls. I'm missing that in my past, and in my present, I, I, I desire the watch. I have to justify the watch, and in my future, I have to think of the outcome. Um, I'll have the watch. I'll know what time it is. I may get the compliments from the pretty girls. Thank you. If I get caught, I can do the time, probably get let off because it's a first offense. You know, that's the process that goes into a choice. It's huge. You ever seen an alcoholic say, well, now listen, if I have 1.5 ounces of alcohol now, I'm going to pass the sobriety test down at that place. Then I can hit Kelly's bar on the way home, have 2.5 beers, check my blood alcohol. If I'm still under a 0.8, I can stop by Kelly's and have, you know, grab a six pack and head home with a couple of airplane snappers on the way. No. It's, I'm thirsty. Give me yours. That's, that's a disease of addiction. Impulsive, like holding your breath. Because the disease of chemical dependency captures the brain's survival system. Okay? And it uses a neurochemical called dopamine, which makes you feel good, as its reward system. It's the same as your breath. Now, what are our priorities? Air, food, water, sex, okay? What's the priorities of a heroin addict? Heroin, 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 and heroin. You say to a heroin addict, well, wait a minute, doesn't your brain want air? Don't you want the next breath? Because you will die if you use again. They'll take the heroin every time. That's a captured brain. That's not a decision. That's a captured brain where the drug replaces the normal addiction or the normal survival prerogatives for the chemical. The more powerful the chemical, the more powerful the addiction. Okay? And that's in a different area of the brain. It's inherited, so it's nobody's fault. What I did with him was my fault. It was a bad behavior and punishment for stealing watches may prevent me from ever doing it again. Punishment never worked a damn worth for an addict or an alcoholic. Okay, it doesn't work because it's genetic environment and the nature of the drug. Good Lord, you get Mother Teresa on some fentanyl, you know, for her double hip surgery and then give her a bottle of Oxycontin and whack her up on those for three days and then steal that crap from the poor girl. She's going to be busted into Walgreens tomorrow to like maybe have them open a little early, you know what I mean? There's no free will here. This is free will with pre-planning for the watch. This is spontaneous. So the captured brain captures the person's willpower as well. So when you're beating a dead horse, it's expecting an alcoholic or addict to just say no. Sorry, Nancy. You're a great lady, but just say no is just dumb. I mean, it's just dumb. All right, so what's the cause of addiction? Ready? Want to see? Watch. <laughs> I went into her space. Her blood pressure went up, not because I'm anything to have your blood pressure go up. I got into her space, her heart rate went up. She released her corticotropin releasing factor. She released cortisol from her brain, and cortisol from her brain started her stress response. This is what we're always trying to act upon. It's what causes our cravings and what is the key mechanism for the disease of chemical dependency. Not everyone who drinks alcohol 
Not everyone who uses drugs is an addict or an alcoholic. But it's not about quantity. It's not about duration. It's about effect and the relationship you have with the drug. Um, how do you know if you've crossed the line? Well, take a look at the consequences usually. Look at the health consequences. Look at the three. Loss of control, craving, and persistent use despite adverse consequences, and you'll usually have it. We used to have the diagnosis of, look at this black line here, of substance abuse and substance dependence. We don't do that anymore. Now we talk about substance use disorder, alcohol or opiates or stimulants or whatever, mild, moderate, or severe, based on about 11 parameters to give us that diagnosis. Most of the people with significant consequences are somewhere between moderate and severe. Certainly with health consequences, high blood pressure, liver, so forth, they're up in here with big relationship consequences and no health consequences, the divorce is pending and I'm still using, my wife is killing me, right up here. Before they get on this line, we're looking at the college kids binging, okay? Risky behaviors, more than seven drinks a week for a lady, more than 14 drinks a week for a man, I told you it wasn't fair, okay? And a binge is more than five drinks in a sitting. Risky behaviors. Hell, we can do that at the game tomorrow, right? Okay. Okay. So that's the continuum of addiction. There's also a continuum of recovery. And you probably have seen this in your loved one. Ah, they're thinking about it, and then they're not thinking about it at all in the first stage. There's nothing wrong with me, Betty Ford, you know, in the old days. There's something wrong with my family. Contemplation, maybe there is something wrong with me. Maybe, maybe the DUI happened because I was, you know, shit-faced. I mean, okay, okay, good. Preparation to terminate. Now, most of the people who have been treated are in the action stage, then the maintenance phase. So we're very, very concerned with alumni groups about our maintenance phase. Okay, what are we doing on a daily basis to make sure we're going to stay sober? Protect the orb. Well, one way is to do this. My name's Harry. I'm an alcoholic. Okay. Um, and I've been sober. There's a number of my coin that is really a matter between me and my sponsor and what I choose to have a higher power. Don't need to impress anybody with it, but by the grace of God, it's a nice number. All you need to know is I've been sober since I've been off my knees this morning. That makes me and you and you and you have exactly the same amount of time. Now we can talk. There's no power differential. That's spiritual connection. You got it? You don't feel shame because you don't have as much time as so-and-so and this guy's a blowhard. And all. You just kind of equal it, okay? Put down the barriers, suck it up, get a little humility. God, we should pray for it. Be careful the guy that tells you how humble he is. <laughs> He may, not, he may not be there yet, okay? Um, only 10% of the people that need treatment for this disease get it. Um, uh, that's a, a problem of access, mainly because of shame and denial. It's, uh, the, the acceptance that leads to change is a, a, a function of awareness. Acceptance uh, may not be possible for someone in the throes of a disease that has them captive. It may not be ready yet. So any way that we can cheat, borrow, beg, or steal to interrupt the disease is critical. I mean, there's not many diseases that require a full intervention. This one does. A room full of people will tell you, you've been an asshole for the last 10 years. Pardon me, I see some naughty things sometimes. <laughs> I don't notice no one left the room, thank you. Um, but that's what an intervention does. Who, me? What, what, what's what's, the, what's the, the mantra of the alcoholic or the addict? Ask any alcoholic, say, hey, by the way, would you, and then he's good, who, me? Yeah, I'm looking, you know, looking at you, you, whoever you are, hi, wave. That's right, you, who, me? <laughs> <laughs> you 
And the other thing I want to tell you about, where, where's Stacy? She's around here somewhere. She's gone. She went. With, Stacy, you get still got my list. All right. So one of the things you never tell an alcoholic or an addict is blame them for something they haven't done. Shut up. Don't do it. This person's been trying for years to maybe get as much as they possibly can, right? Okay, monitor on a regular basis so you have proof, and they have proof that either they can generate um, um, documented sobriety, or you can demonstrate that they've fallen away, but don't haphazardly blame someone who may be trying harder than they ever have to walk the line. Hell knows, we've tried for years to fool your sorry ass, right? We got away with murder for it, okay? Well, we're trying. Why don't you want to do it? Because they'll immediately go to the weak spot in recovery, and that's, that's um, um, a good resentment. And it's the best excuse to be drinking. So that kind of a process deserves a meeting, uh, an Al-Anon sponsor, um, uh, someone else who understands the codependency. Don't police your alcoholic or your addict. You don't want to do that. That's not your job. It's not your, your talent. You can't do that. It's very dangerous, and you can push someone right back out of the room. You don't want to do that, okay? Oh, we should talk about big shots. And these are big shots, okay? Uh, big shots are, um, did anybody see this picture before? John Singer Sargent um, did this photo. Uh, it is about 20 by 20. It hangs in the medical library at Hopkins. Okay? At the time, doctors were raided by the feds for a while because they realized that you could get a medical degree by paying enough money if your family had it. With half a high school education, you could become a doctor and sell snake oil in any community and, and make money for it. And the snake oil was usually alcohol and morphine and cocaine. Now that made anybody better, okay? And half the town would chase the guy's wagon down the road and say, wait a minute, I need to get some more for next week, you know. So it was a, a nice business model, but they closed about half of the medical schools and this one was named the best medical school and was Hopkins, okay? Yale and Harvard people, don't like that, but this was a, and these were the men. Um, Howard Kelly uh, of Kelly Clamp fame. Anybody know what a Kelly Clamp is? It's a hemostat with a curve on it. Well, you must be old because we, we stole them all from the emergency rooms to smoke dope when we were kids, right? We take the, so there's no more Kelly Clamps, and if you have one, I want, you got one? I want it, you got one. Oh, you have one. You have one, right, just one? I'm looking for a Kelly clamp somewhere. I mean, they're just, they had the nice little curse where you didn't burn yourself and you smoke, you know, you smoke that little thing down and burn your mouth. Yeah, yeah, right, 60s. If you remember them, you weren't there. That's all I remember. Dr. Kelly was a real weirdo. He was like a charismatic snake charmer, religious weirdo. The most published gynecologist in the world and the richest physician. People came from everywhere to see this man. Um, Harvey Welsh. Dr. Welsh was the greatest medical educator responsible for medical curriculum. He invented the test to define a bug called Clostridium welshi and tetani, so he discovered tetanus. Um, he was a big shot. The greatest physician of all time, Canadian, Sir William Osler. Some people know that Osler's quotes, you know, span invented internships. <laughs> that, I'm going to tell you that the guy standing up invented residencies. <laughs> now all these guys are sitting down regular, but look at the guy standing up. Anybody know who that is? William Stewart Halstead. Okay, Halstead, the greatest surgeon known to man. I guarantee you that today, within a 100 mile radius of us, 200 surgical procedures will be done that he invented back then. He invented the blood transfusion when he found his wife in postpartum hemorrhage and plugged himself in and plugged it in and gave it to her. He invented the rubber glove and cut surgical infection rates in half. 
he put his mother on the kitchen table in Albany and invented a, the, a, a cholecystectomy to remove an acute gall, ruptured gallbladder and his mother lived another eight years. He was such an arrogant son of a bitch <laughs> that he, one of his students was Harvey Cushing. When I had my brain to remove, I went to the Harvey Cushing professor of medicine at Harvard. Harvey Cushing, his student was the father of neurosurgery. That's how this guy was. He was a little bit of a dandy. You know what a dandy is? He liked to dress fancy and walk around fancy. And he was a fancy. He could not find anybody. He was a weirdo. He could not find anybody in his Baltimore or his native New York who was worthy of doing his shirts. So he sent his laundry to Paris. Yeah, you gotta have a lot of shirts. It's a turnaround time, right? He would go out on the streets of Baltimore at night and hand pick his own firewood. Okay? Now the reason I have him here is to show you his arrogance. He's with the greatest men of all time and he would not sit the two weeks for this picture unless they busted a hole in that wall and moved the globe next to him for stand, stand next to. If you notice his left thumb, it's deformed. And that deformity he'll never forgive Sargent for to this day. He's dead a long time for accurately depicting the great surgeon's thumb deformity. He also is the addict. The seminal addict of function, of high functioning alcoholics or addicts, this is the prototype. The, the name of the uh, Netflix show is The Nick. And you see The Nick? It's his story, okay? Watch it, it's amazing. So this guy finds that there's a man in Austria, um, in Vienna, named Freud. And he starts reading this guy Freud's work and realizes that this guy Freud is trying to treat people with cocaine. Now Freud was a crazy coke addict. Okay, you know, he was like one for you, the patient, and two for me, one for you, one, two for me, three for you, one, two, three for me, you know, that he was just way out. And he um, published that everybody he gave cocaine to um, would have regional numbness below the injection site. So this guy goes and turns that into regional anesthesia nerve blocks. So he invented regional anesthesia nerve blocks. Unfortunately, he did all of his practicing on all of his residents. So the entire department of surgery at Hopkins was addicted to cocaine thanks to this schmuck, right? <laughs> now being the arrogant guy he was, he made the major mistake of any physician, you know? Physician who treats himself has an idiot for a patient and an idiot for a doctor, okay? He treated himself and his cure for um, cocaine addiction was morphine. So he became hopelessly addicted to morphine. The point is that you can be the most accomplished of the accomplished and it will just fool you every time. Winston Churchill was one of the greatest alcoholics we've ever known. But this guy is like beyond and it is by him and for him that I devised our professional program to deal with the arrogance and the entitlement. Now you don't have to be, you know, a, a neurosurgeon, a pilot, or a, um, a lawyer to understand that what makes him the best is he would diagnose himself and minimize his disease. All lawyers will use their number one talent, which is to argue their disease. All pilots will use their number one talent and control their way around the disease. That's why we put them in programs that have the highest success rate of anything, which is 90 days of treatment and five years of monitoring where they have to pee in a cup for five years and the success rate published in my book is 78 to 80 percent at five years. So we always want to engage patients in the aftercare program that we have here at the Bridge, and that is the 52-week aftercare program. It's going to give you the best result. You want a better result? Go 104. You want a better result? Three years, five years, whatever. Accountability, 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 backed up with monitoring.
You want me to believe you don't drink after you stole my wallet a hundred times and ran off with my car and my wife? I think maybe I'd like to see the evidence. We have devices now that will give you computerized records. I have physicians that blow into a device three times a day so that in a court of law they can prove that they're sober before surgery. I have lawyers doing it before cases. I have uh, uh, pilots can't do it. They can't fly for six months and then the FAA just monitor, monitors them before every flight. And that's why they have the prototype program. So, you know, um, the thing that makes the doctor, lawyer, Indian chief the best at what they are, independent, self-sufficient, in control, authoritative, and perfectionist are the antithesis of what works in recovery, where you have to depend on someone else. You follow? So you get a, everybody who uses has a system. We're always trying to find the system. Who helps enable them? Who helps support them? And bust the system, have everybody help destroy the system while we create a new system of recovery. That's where sponsors come in, that's where monitoring comes in, that's where a lot of humility comes in, that's where your doctor comes in. So you're always trying to um, demonstrate that you'll get back your health, you get back your cognitive function. There's a lot of, lot of skin in this game, but it's worth it, right? Okay, longest treatment, monitoring afterwards is the key. What do you get from recovery? You learn how to stop, you learn how to cope, and you learn how to live a full and happy life. You, so, um, how do we go about this? What does treatment mean? We got a detox, we got residential, we got all kinds of treatment, IOP and PHP, partial hospitalization. But really to stop is, is dictated by our body chemistry and what the effects are uh, on our body chemistry. Some people need a formal medical, uh, medically assisted and devised detoxification. The blood pressure needs to be controlled. Many people need seizure medication to prevent seizures. The worst detoxes and the most dangerous are benzodiazepines and alcohol, not opiates. Certainly not stimulants. Those are the worst, okay? And so, I, uh, you know, we're never really recovered. We're always in recovery because it's an ongoing process. And the secret to this recovery is every day trying to have uh, a renewal of our first step. So those of you that are in recovery and you know what your first step is, in my book I shortened it to there is a power that wants to kill me. Go ahead, Mark. What is the quality of surrender? What is the quality of my surrender? On some days, I'll put down the sword, but I'll keep the shield. And some days, the shield is just a defensive weapon. On some days, it's an offensive weapon. Shields were designed to be as offensive as a sword. They have a point on them. Some of them were sharpened in the old days. They could be very offensive. So if I don't have complete, unqualified, unconditional surrender, which is scary and naked. I like that part. <laughs> Come on. I told you this can't be boring or we're not going to do it. You know what I mean? Gee, that gives me a new idea for a special treatment. <laughs> special treatment camp. It would have to be out of the country. But, um, so we got to go through detox and withdrawal. Um, people cycle through abstinence and relapse. I'm going to tell, show you a little bit about the anatomy of a craving here in just a minute. But the way we try to cope is to realize that abstinence, there's more to stop and drinking than stop and drinking. There's more to stop and using than stop and using. Nothing worse in the world than a dry drunk. Ever live with one? Oh my God. How many of you said, please have a drink? Please stop trying. Just ever live with a smoker trying to quit? It's the same way. You run out and buy the cigarettes, right? Um, um, I love George Carlin. Just because the, the monkey got off your back doesn't mean the circus is the left town. You know I mean, I mean that's, that's, that's pretty accurate for how this works. We cope trying to use this suggested program, 12 steps. Some people don't work in the 12-step format very well. Because it's, if you read the literature, it puts some people off. It's got a lot of Judeo-Christian backgrounding in it. There's a lot of God references that don't connect with people. I am 
absolutely convinced that this disease kills people. If you don't believe in the fatal nature of this disease, you'll stop treating it, okay? And so I'll cheat whatever it takes. These kids here, watch my language. Here they are. <laughs> we must use a program of abstinence basis that causes us to have complete surrender and allows us the spiritual connection. And you know what? If you can't find the right fit, use the guidance of a counselor or helper to find the right fit. There's, it's not the only way to get sober. It's my way, and I love it, and I wrote about it. But the 12 steps is ancient tradition. You'll find it in the old writings and scriptures, one form or another. I mean, what could be wrong with honesty, hope? I mean, those are the first couple of steps. Hope, when you're in trouble, right? What could be wrong with courage and integrity, willingness? What could be wrong with surrender? What could be wrong with brotherly love and sharing what your, your good fortune? So the principles of the program, the, the principles are, are, you know, transcend all philosophies. And they've been around, if you do comparative religious studies, in one form or another. <coughs> Everybody strives for the good. So the only thing that recovery does is takes people, to wonderful people who maybe have had a bad disease and of course have done a few bad things and tries to correct that. That's, that's okay, okay? We have a belief system that resonates with us and we act accordingly. Step five, integrity. <coughs> Step five is integrity. The cognitive deficit that's demonstrated in most people that I admit to the hospitals at the time that they need help also works against them in recovery. I told you the disease is caused by stress. Well, recovery causes stress. It's hard to get, and that's why you're never too old or sober to review this. This book that I wrote was designed to be reread annually because you will absolutely hear something this year you weren't able to hear last year, okay? We go to meetings with other people afflicted with this disease to avoid the research. Oh, really? The stove is hot? Now, if you're like me, you go to the Mexican restaurant, right, and they come out and don't touch the plate. The free hot is pissing oil and it's going sizzle, sizzle, and they put it down in front of you with nine napkins wrapped around the head. Don't touch the plate. The guy goes away and I go, you know, the white marks and everything. What is that? Well, how hot is it? You know, like, you know, don't drink. I, I had 25 years of sobriety. I decided to go to Las Vegas. I never went there. Don't do it. I never, you know, I didn't say that the rooms of Alcoholics and Anonymous is a bastion of sanity. Okay? I mean, so we anticipate that stuff. Okay? Um, I'm going to tell you about a couple of things that I think are important gems, so be mindful of time. First of all, in the Journal of Behavioral Psychiatry, they said something about this, this disease that is some of the most profound stuff I could share with you. And that is that they took a group of rats, poor little rats, and gave this group drugs and alcohol, and this group they put into a little holder that makes their little heads pop, and they gave them a controlled, spring-loaded blow to the head. They caused the traumatic brain injury. They sacrificed the animals and cut their brains up into microscopic slides. Those slides were mixed up and given to a group of really well-known neuropathologists. They couldn't tell the difference. Drugs and alcohol are like hitting yourself with a baseball bat. The cunning, baffling nature of this disease is we love the feeling of getting hit by the baseball bat. <laughs> we are addicted to the feeling of brain cells dying. We are addicted to the feeling of the brain. How, what could be a more perfect disease than to addict you to the feeling of, a brain, of the brain cells dying? That's what getting high or loaded is. We have to teach the kids that.
before they get addicted to the feeling of the brain cells dying. The other thing I want to tell you about is the dot. I wrote the dot over there. So somebody comes to me and says, here's your x-ray. This is the paradox of the disease of addiction. Um, you have um, something on your lungs that looks like what we might think is metastatic or, or carcinoma of the lung. I guarantee you that I have nothing else in my consciousness but those three words. Carcinoma of the lung. We want to do surgery. We want to cut it out. We want to take some lymph nodes and see if it's spread. We want to give you six months of radiation. We want to give you six months of, of chemotherapy. Because this could spread and be fatal if we don't take out a portion of your lung and then treat you accordingly. And then you're going to come to my office every week for a year, every other week for two years, and then every month until year five. And when I get out to year five, suddenly I either have a remission or a cure. It feels better. Did I argue at any point with those directives? Carcinoma of the lung means death to me. Melanoma means death to me. Now you say to somebody, you have the disease of chemical dependency. And what do they say? You're full of shit. <laughs> I want another opinion. Get me somebody else in here. This is crap. This is baloney. I want another opinion. You're as stupid as your mother was. I just drink normally like your brother Willie. And then, all of a sudden, the catastrophic event happens, and we realize that that wants to kill me, that there is a power that maybe wants me to live for some reason. I've decided that I want to live, and I engage in a program. You see the difference? This, I'm never going to get cured of this. As a matter of fact, if I'm doing my program right, and I surrender each morning, and I'm a brand new alcoholic each morning, with all the accumulated knowledge that I have by having another day in the program, that disease will be bigger today than it was 20 years ago. And bigger yet tomorrow, because something I'll hear from you today. That is a critical factor in this disease. Understood? Anybody ever have a concussion in this room? Did you want to do your income tax? Oh, you've had a few. Uh, <laughs> huh? Right, a couple of games without the helmet, right, pal? OK, so why do we have NFL protocols? Why? You get a whack in the head. You remember the mice? Yeah. OK. You get a whack in the head, what happens? Headache, vomiting, nausea, blurred vision. He's got a concussion. Here's the protocol. Take him out for two weeks. You all heard the stories about the guy who went back in, lied about his symptoms. What happens? Next hit, right? Second impact syndrome, boom! Guy's brain swells and he's dead. Nausea, vomiting, right? Dizziness, emotional lability, stress intolerance. Sound familiar? It's called withdrawal symptoms in this disease. The same as a concussion syndrome. Post-concussion syndrome is post-acute withdrawal. If you are within the first year of recovery and you're trying to wonder whether or not you should marry Sally, give it a little time, okay, for her sake, okay? This is not a great time to be making decisions. Post-acute withdrawal is a dangerous time for us. We don't go back into the full game without the sponsor and without guidance. Always watch for self-will run riot. It will come and get you. And remember, alcoholics and addicts, it is not just about you. This is a contagious disease that takes prisoners. This is a family disease. Mrs. Ford insisted that we treat it as a family disease. Okay? So your drinking impacts everybody. If you're one of those people who say, it just affected me and never affected anybody else, you don't know what you're talking about. If you say, I only drank on Friday nights, 
and Saturdays, sobered up on Sundays, and it never affected my work, you don't know what you're talking about. Your brain wasn't working the same way. Do you want that neurosurgeon who partied in Vegas on Friday and Saturday to cut you open on Monday? <laughs> he may have a zero blood alcohol, but I'm telling you right now, the elevator's not going all the way up. <laughs> that takes time, that takes neuroplasticity. The hope is that you're born with 100 billion neurons. If you never did drugs or alcohol your entire life, you'd die with 95 billion neurons. You only lose 5% by attrition. But we have one quadrillion connections in our brain, which is the neuroplasticity that's the miracle of healing of chemical dependency. I've never seen anybody who can't make it unless they're so far gone with Wernicke-Korsakoff's disease from repeated trials and interventions that can't get sober and have a better life. That's the message of hope. There are no hopeless cases. Don't leave before the miracle. Twelve steps, very simple. I wrote them because I went to the Betty Ford Center and on my first night at the Betty Ford Center, I checked in. I checked in for the 10-day program. <laughs> a friend of mine who is an addictionologist said, you gotta go, they have a 10-day program for doctors. What he was talking about was their marketing program. I went there and the program was 90 days. <laughs> so I did what any red-blooded doctor in total and complete cooperative self-help mode would do. I gave them a phony credit card and my brother's ID. <laughs> Truth. I checked under the name of Harry Lewis. That's not my name. Medical records will never forgive me for the changes they had to make six weeks after I was there. On the first night, a lady named Lucy came up. She was the tech that checked you in. She was the tallest woman I have ever seen. <coughs> She was a biker, tatted from head to toe. Anybody remember Dagmar and Jane Mansfield? That was Lucy. You remember Jane Mansfield. <laughs> Team, look at you. See, uh, should I talk about the craving brain now? Uh, I am. All right. So Jane Mansfield uh, came in to me and said, "This is Jose." I said, "Oh, is he going to take my luggage?" She says, "No, he's going to search it." <laughs> so I, I, they go through my luggage, and I didn't think it was odd. I had all my luggage made with smuggler's pouches inside. <laughs> you could have that done. They hide them in there, and you can. So I always needed something to travel, something to keep me awake, and something to put me to sleep. It just seemed like good, you know, manipulation of the sleep wake cycle, which is all I did, right? <laughs> and, you know, if I'm the only guy in town and you want to get seen seven days a week, you better give me some speed. And so I took 74 hits of speed with me to the Betty Ford Center. <laughs> At that time, it was baby speed, fen fentermine, but it was speed. So I took it in, and she waved it, because I kept it normally in a Tic Tac box, because it looked like Tic Tac. <laughs> Wasn't trying to fool anybody. She said, oh, he can keep that. Now, here's the secret, in case you ever go into treatment, that you need to know about. If you... I keep a mag light in my shaving kit. If you unscrew a flashlight and take out two AA batteries, the bigger ones of the two, AAA is small, two AA batteries from your mag light, it will hold 60 hits <laughs> of fentamine before you crush your shit by turning the little, little spring thing on. So I threw the batteries away and threw my speed into my flashlight. Okay? Um, now, what was I going to do with the other 14 hits that didn't fit in my flashlight? Who said that? I did. You know, you may be more than I thought. <laughs> Give him a month. All right. I took him. Now I'm stuck in Ottenstein Hall. There is no TV, nobody to talk to, <laughs> only that stupid AA book. I read it in... Swahili, I read it in Icelandic where the words are this big. They had one copy that was in Hebrew, I read it backwards. I said, what's the matter with these people? This language means nothing, it's 19th. That's why I wrote the book, so that this would become more understandable, okay? 
So I went back and decided that we needed to understand that A, there is a power that wants to kill me. And the character defect is denial, I had a lot of it, but the principle was something called honesty. That there was a power that wanted me to live. I identified that from my old Catholic altar boy upbringing. It took away my despair, a character defect, and gave me some hope. This is where people relapse. Do I want to live or do I want to die? Relapse is the final stage of the disease. Understand this. If my drink, drug, is sitting there, then two, three, four, five, six months out, from my drink is where my relapse starts. Okay. It's a deterioration of recovery principles. I don't have to go to a meeting tonight. Work is more important than my recovery. You know, she's got a short skirt and a wedding ring. We can make that work. <laughs> um, I don't like my sponsor. He's fat and stupid. What am I going to do with him? Ooh, you're so cute. I, I just don't know. But why do they put all this emphasis on? So my recovery principles are fading, and I'm three months away from my drink. Now, because of my lack of awareness and unwillingness to get someone who has some awareness involved in this, I don't know that I have all this time to discover a relapse before it's going to happen. The final act is picking up my drink. You follow that? So relapse prevention is all about what I'm going to do. Read the book. All, what I'm going to do to assess myself. Now when I get in here at two months, the Vulcan traction beam starts. <laughs> and there's no choice. I'm on a run, okay? You've all seen the pictures of the craving brain and how it starts, right? Yep. The craving brain starts like a computer virus. I'm getting my, the worst thing you can do in your first year of sobriety is go to a wedding. I've had a bride not go to her wedding because of that. And the reason is impactful, and that is a wedding offers you every craving trigger you can imagine. Alcohol, a group permission to be over, overly festive, permission to indulge and overindulge, short skirts, my favorite. I gotta look into that. Um, <laughs> alcohol, drugs, somebody smoking outside, something sniffing in the, everything, okay? It's there for you. The alcoholic or addict who takes his will back tells you, I gotta go to that wedding, it's my brother Louis. No, it's the most dangerous thing. No, I can go. So they go and they white knuckle it. And they get through the wedding and look at you like, what do you know? I didn't use, but they let the virus in. Now, this is what happens. So two, three, four, five months after the exposure, the virus get act, gets activated by the slightest thing, a little resentment, an extra bill in the mail, or an argument with your boss. The slightest little thing, my car breaks down, a bad name, boom, there's the drink. Boom, there's the prescription. I go to the doctor and, no, there's nothing wrong with me. Hydrocodone, here, for, for cleaning your teeth. You follow? This is the end of the relapse, okay? Knowing that full well, you answer the question, am I willing to go through the daily routine? What's a good one? Roll over onto your stomach when you wake up in the morning. Slide out of bed so your knees fall and hit first. Just say thank you. And do step one, two, and three. My name's Harry, I'm an alcoholic. Thank you very much for giving me hope that I'm gonna get through today. You know what, if I do yesterday what I did today, it's gonna be a great day. What did I do? I'm already in step four. I took away my fear. What's insanity? Same thing over and over again, expecting different results. 
faith, same thing over and over again, expecting the same results. So if I do yesterday, today may be okay, and I'll get through it, okay? Make my bed, brush my teeth, read a couple of things on my iPad from, you know, my, my spiritual readings, um, call somebody up and give them hope, and I've already done step one, two, three, four, 10, 11, and 12. Last night I did 10, and I erased my slate and made it clean. Every night that we do a 10 step, we erase our slate and do it clean. Wake up in the morning, and what happens to our nice clean slate? If you don't do the ritual, I doubt that I'm an alcoholic. I'm angry that I have to live my life this way. I have a resentment about those damn people that did the intervention. I can take it back and do it. My, suddenly, my slate is filled. Before I go to the bathroom and take a shower, my slate is filled with full-blown ism of alcoholism. There's not a drug in me. That's me on the road to that drink. So if I leave you with anything today, it's relapse prevention. Study it. If you have any questions, these ladies can access me in a minute. I'm happy to help. <coughs> do you want to live or die? Then shut up and do it. It ain't a bad disease to have. The treatment is not like chemotherapy. We all have crosses to bear. It's infective. You get a chance to help someone else and lead a beautiful life and see the glow of hope in their eyes. Using example from your past life, understand that your actions are, you know what that means? Admit it to somebody in the fifth step. Decide whether you want to live this way anymore. If you want help, ask for it. See, I always thought that my disease, and it, this is how it worked. I, I have no training fighting. This guy's name is Iron Mike Tyson, right? Tyson's got the, you know, the tattoo on his face, and I go in and say, I can beat you up, and I take a cup, boom, boom. Ribs are cracked, spleen's gone, jaw's broken. They drag me back into the corner. I'm bleeding. They're throwing in the towel. I grab the guy. I say, no, 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 I can do this. <laughs> That's how I drank. I can, give me another shot. I go back in. Now the guy lifts me with an uppercut off the ground, spleen, liver laceration. They pull me back again. I say, yeah, this isn't working so well. But I'm going to go back in. <laughs> and they say, wait a minute. Step seven. You see this guy? He's in a white robe, higher power in the back. This guy can kick out of that guy. Oh, terrific. I run back in, and he kills me again. Now, that didn't work. I come back, and I say, hey, where were you? I'm Italian. Where, <laughs> where were you? Big shot. He says, you didn't ask. You didn't ask with humility and grace. You assumed. You were entitled. You got to lower those expectations and do the work and ask. Pride cometh before the fall. Humility. If you want change, ask for help. Figure out how to make all the things you screwed up right that you did wrong. Don't screw up anything else when you do it. I went to uh, an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting in New Orleans, and a friend of mine yells out of the audience, Tuna, Tuna. <coughs> My name's Harry Tunian. I haven't heard Tuna since I was an intern. <laughs> and he was an intern with me, about 50 pounds heavy. He says, Tuna, I have got to meet you tonight. I have an amends I've been trying to make for 30 years. I said, terrific. I get my sponsor. He didn't have one. We go to dinner for Jambalaya in Mobile, Alabama. He says, Tuna, 30 years ago, 35, I had an affair with your wife. Ouch. I said, Weez, 35 years ago, I had an affair with yours. <laughs> he got the best end of that deal. I got to tell you, he, he got the best end of the deal. So it's about unfairness and resentment. So justice is this principle. Mistakes are human. 
give yourself a break. My wife once spoke at the Betty Ford Center and the ladies asked her, what would be the number one advice you give for someone new in recovery? She said, be kind to yourselves, be gentle. We're delicate. We're not designed to take all of the stuff we put ourselves through. If it takes drugs or alcohol to deal with the stress, move the stress and ask for help with humility and get it where you might not be looking. You know, it's there. Ask your higher power for help in treating others the way you would want to be treated by your higher power. And pass it on. Thank you.